of the cathedral. As you can see, it looks different from the rest. That's because it's built in a Romanesque styled architecture. Now, as you can see, the Romanesque style has quite thick walls, it has round arches, small windows, and has this zigzag pattern some places. Now, if you've been in Romanesque cathedrals before, you might notice that those are painted. Now, ours used to this be painted. is, of course, the Romanesque style, but also because we have an inscription in the chapel of St. John the Baptist himself. This is an inscription in Latin, so if anybody knows Latin, very fun to go and read. And this inscription gives us a date, and it's the only date that we have in this church. And that date is the 24th of November, 1161. Wow. So we assume that that inscription was put there when the transept was finished. After the transept uh, in the Romanesque style, the Gothic style starts coming to Norway and becoming the trend here. So they decide to expand the choir to the size that you can see today in the Gothic style. Now, the Gothic style was not only decorative, it was also functional because it allowed one to build higher. So if you look to the southern wall here in the transept, the higher up you get, the more Gothic you get because you start getting short arches. You start getting smaller, uh, thinner walls and bigger windows. So when they was built with the Gothic style, they decided, oh, we'll put another floor on the Romanesque before expanding the choir. Now, the point of it being so tall is that you were supposed to reach towards God and reach towards heaven, get as close as possible. The decorative elements of leaves and flowers, lilies, are supposed to make you feel like you're in eyes than it is today, rather than how it looks. Because we've had five fires since then, we've had a restoration Finished period. In 13, so what we see is a mix of restoration and reconstruction. But we'll get into that eventually. I would like to assume that some of you here are perhaps wondering why we have uh, a church this big so far up north. Mm. Some, some, yes. Okay, some people are uh, interested. That is because of St. Olaf. I assume you probably have heard that name, yes? So St. Olaf here is our national saint of Norway and also the area that we are in, England, England to France and other places saint in Europe. Olaf. And during these travels, he discovered for himself Christianity. So he himself became Christian 
and we believe that he was baptized in Rouen in France. We're not entirely sure, but that's one of the stories, at least. During these voyages, while he was in France, he got a calling from God, and God told him that he was the one that was going to go back to Norway, become king, and Christian the country. So, Olaf decided to go back to Norway in the year 1015, and he got elected then as king because he bought allies, uh, and then brought priests from England and from Germany to then help him in making Christianity the only legal religion in this country today. Now, he lay there for about a year and five days. It's very specific because during that year and five days, stories of miracles start spreading around in Norway and in Europe. These are stories, for example, about wounded soldiers during the battle who found themselves around Olaf's body who were just miraculously healed. Uh, there were stories of blind men who came in contact with his blood, wiped their eyes with it, and just got their sight back. So because of this, the priests at the time decided to open Olaf's tomb and look exactly what was going on. And what he found was that when he opened it, a fresh scent of roses came out of the tomb. And I remind you, he's been dead for a year and five days. He should be de decomposing by now. <laughs> but it looked like he was asleep. His hair had grown, his nails had grown, his cheeks were rosy. So they decided to canonize him. They declared him a saint. And Olaf's tomb was then placed in a silver case. And that silver case was placed on the high altar for about 500 years afterwards. This then became a center, uh, a religious center, and therefore a center of pilgrimage. So people would typically come here to be healed, because that is what Olaf did. He gave healing miracles. So a pilgrim would typically have to walk, or you could release the weight. So that's what the stones are for there. Then you continue a little bit more, and you'll find Olaf's well, where the pilgrims would then fill up their holy water. Today there, are no, uh, there is no water there, however you use it more as a wishing well today. Then you would come out and your pilgrimage would be complete. Now as you can see we are missing a very big part of our pilgrimage, which is Olaf himself. So we went through a reformation in 1537, where we were originally in a union between uh, us, Sweden and Denmark, but then Denmark decided to annex us from this union and then invaded us. So in 1537, we became Danish, and they were Protestants, so we became Protestant. Now, the biggest difference between Catholicism and Protestantism is that you stop believing in saints, because the only thing that is holy is God. So, because all of us are saints, he is a distraction. So the Danish decide to take his silver case to Copenhagen and melt it into silver coins. Uh. And according to some stories, the Swedish then took his body to Sweden, because we have a great relationship with our neighbors, <laughs> and eventually gave him back, and then he was reburied in secret. And that secret is actually so well kept today that we don't know where he is. Mm. So according to tradition, he is still under that high altar. However, he can be anywhere else in the church. He can be in a church down the street. He can be in the river. There's even a church uh, further south that claims that they have him but we do not believe them, <laughs> because the only place that he could be would be here. So, if anyone asks, if I tell you the way you can actually see today was built during the 20th century, that might tell you that something uh, quite big happened here at some point. Fire. In 1531, lightning hit mm. the tower, and the tower collapsed over the nave where we're standing here. So for about 350 years, this was in ruins. We had about two meters of wall, maybe, on each side, which you can see very well in the south there, the difference between the old and the new stone. Mm -hmm. Now, this happened six years before our Reformation, and that is important because when we become Protestant, the church is not allowed to collect tax, which means that they had no money to rebuild what we see. We only started rebuilding and restoring when we established our restoration workshop in 1869. And when we established this workshop, and in the south, you'll find the New Testament stories. It's very interesting to go and read Windows. if you have read any of the uh, Testaments. You read it from the west, 
and towards the east, and you read it from down and up. So it's kind of like a comic book, just in reverse. The Rose Window Behind Me is probably the largest project that we had. Uh, it consists of 10,000 pieces of colored glass. The whole thing itself represents Doomsday, Judgment Day, Dies uh, in Latin, if you prefer, and it's eight meters in diameter. Now, under there, you'll find one of our four organs in this church. This organ is called the Steinmeier organ. It's from 1930, and it is the largest one in Scandinavia. And now, I have a question for you this time. How many pipes do you think this organ has? More than a thousand. More than two thousand. Mm. <laughs> Five thousand. <laughs> more than six thousand. One more guess? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Ten thousand. It has almost ten thousand pipes. I think it was about nine thousand and six hundred and twenty. Now, the longest pipe, or the tallest pipe, is 11 meters, but you don't see all of the pipes here in the front. They are, of course, here and around this structure, but they are also in the triforium heights, the heights above us, here in the nave, around the spire, and also in the choir. So when it's played, you hear it everywhere. It is an amazing sound. Now, another organ that we have is in the middle and towards the north, up in the heights. That is our oldest organ. It's called the Wagner organ, and it is a Baroque organ uh, from about 1740. Now, the organ that we have here is one of five of its kind, and the one we have here is the only one outside of its home country, Germany. So it's quite special to us. Now, it's quite important for us to note that we still use these organs regularly, both for concerts and for services. Uh, in just a few minutes, we'll actually have a, an organ demonstration on this organ, uh, which you guys are very welcome to uh, sit and listen to. It's included in your ticket and everything. Uh, but we also use this church as it's supposed to be used. We still have a congregation. Today, we are uh, Lutheran Protestant. Uh, however, we use the church ecumenically. So any denomination of Christianity can use this church for services if they want. So... Side of the cathedral. That's why I just left it. Graveyard.
Old bridge, ancient bridge, old town. 